Welcome to the Fretboard Journal Podcast. I am Jason Burgundy, the publisher of the Fretboard Journal. And as always, that is John Rauhaus in the background. But as Creston Lee has pointed out, Creston was a Fretboard Journal Podcast guest as well as an incredible guitar maker. He still is. Why am I using the past tense? Uh, that's not a pedal steel guitar. I keep saying it's John Rauhaus on the pedal steel. I am so used to seeing John Rauhaus play the pedal steel guitar with Nico Case that I, I was kind of a space cadet. And didn't realize that that is probably more of a dobro. I think that's actually John's Haymaker guitar that was built by Donald Wyndham playing in the background. But anyways, I wanted to get that correction out of the way. This is going to be a fun episode. It is a banjo double header episode. Uh Uh-oh. I think I just lost all of my listeners. No, I didn't lose all my listeners. You guys are used to this. You guys love that the Fretboard Journal covers banjos, mandolins, and guitars, right? Uh... Well, we have a good episode. First up, I'm going to be talking to Laura Baird. Um, She is from the Baird Sisters, but she has a new solo record out, and uh, it's coming out this month. We actually are previewing uh, Pretty Polly from that album on our website right now, fretboardjournal.com. Check that out. If you are a fan of the more primitive, maybe the darker side of traditional American music and Appalachian music, you will love this record. I certainly did. Um, And then after that, I'm going to be talking to Author, author Richard Jones Bamman, who actually was one of the co-founders of Griffin Stringed Instruments way back when, but um, he has a new book out called Building New Banjos for an Old Time World, and this is sort of a scholarly take on the world of banjos and the old, old-time open-back banjo scene, which is kind of its own little unique universe unto itself. So I hope you enjoy that conversation. We have two sponsors today. First up, we are talking, of course, about our friends over at Retrofret Vintage Guitars. Retrofret is sort of, I've said it before, it's kind of a cabinet of wonders if you've ever been to their brick-and-mortar store in Brooklyn. They have so much cool stuff, um, and this week is certainly no exception. They have a 1937 D'Angelico Excel. They have a 1934 Buzato Petite Model Gypsy Jazz Guitar. They have a Gibson, a 60... Gibson GA79T, that's the Gibson stereo amp that sort of looks like a Watkins Dominator. The speakers are kind of angled. And my favorite part of that amp is that at the very top it says multi-purpose. They wanted you to plug both your hi-fi into it as well as your guitar cord into it. Um, And so much more. Go to retrofret.com, see what they have. They continue to unearth amazing vintage instruments uh, of all stripes. Uh, and of all price points and you can uh, also reach out to them if you ever need any repair or restoration work and i can tell you they do fine work on both of those fronts retrofret.com or check out their instagram page and if you do reach out to them tell them the fretboard journal sent you there is a lot going on in the world of guitars right now obviously we just lost tom petty which was um really sad uh and uh unexpected he had just played a week or two ago like everybody else, I, you know, got inundated with great Tom Petty songs on Facebook as these things happen when people pass away. And uh, it was great to revisit so much of that music. We never got to interview Tom Petty in the magazine, which is a shame. But, um, you know, it was it was he was a profound influence on me and so many of our readers. So um Sad to hear that. One of the best things that I saw on YouTube or one of the most enlightening things was there's actually a a video on YouTube of him with Gary Shandling and they're just kind of walking through Tom's house slash recording studio and and talking about life and kind of shooting the shit. And I actually thought that was a really interesting portal into Tom's life that not many of us got to see outside of the concert stage. And so check that out if you are so inclined. I really liked it. Um, other big guitar news, Fretboard Journal 40 is about to come out, which is exciting for us. Um, our buddy, Matt Munisteri, who is one of my favorite guitarists, uh, just announced that he's going to be teaching on pegheadnation.com, which is really exciting. I am looking forward to ordering those lessons. Uh, and in other instruction news, our buddy, Adam Levy, who's written for the magazine numerous times, done a bunch of stories for the Fretboard Journal, has Launch Guitar Tips Pro. I've mentioned this before, guitartipspro.com. It is a Patreon site where you can get weekly videos and tab from Adam. It doesn't cost a ton of money. Adam is an incredible instructor. Um, This is a totally fun, low-key way to learn um, some new licks and some new songs and, uh, and wrap your head around some new techniques. 
to uh, get a private lesson from Adam would cost you an arm and a leg, and you'd have to work out scheduling and his tour schedule and all that other stuff. Um, this way, you can just kind of get lessons as you need them on a weekly basis. Um, go to guitartipspro.com if you want to learn more about that. I'm not getting paid by Adam. I just want to give him a shout out and tell him that uh, tell you guys that he's doing a cool thing. Uh, I, our other sponsor, though, for today's podcast is Lane over at Dying Breed Music. Lane continues, I don't know how he does it, he keeps getting these amazing vintage flat top guitars, mainly Gibsons and Martins, that's kind of a specialty, but he gets other stuff too. Um, Right now he's got a 1941 Gibson Super Jumbo 100 available, a 1942 Martin D18, which is a total player's grade guitar, but I have a feeling it sounds fantastic. He's got that 1935 Gibson Jumbo that we talked about before, and a 1919 Martin 045 His inventory is always changing. He does a ton of consignment work. You can reach out to him at 870-818-3434 to uh, get the latest or just uh, hear what he's up to. You can also go to dyingbreedguitars.com and and see his old inventory that way, or he's on G-Base too. Um, But check out his stuff. Uh, We we really are in awe of all the cool guitars he gets. It's fun to be able to plug them every week on the podcast because I love seeing what he's up to. All right, I hope you enjoy our uh, banjo-filled doubleheader episode here. Once again, Laura's got a song on fretboardjournal.com right now if you want to hear what her music is all about. And uh, and Richard's book is out on Amazon right now, too, if you want to go buy that book and, and read about the open back banjo movement. So, Laura, you, um, I know you've been performing with your sister forever, and so I'm assuming you grew up in a music that was just filled with music, uh, grew up in a house that was just filled with music. Uh, is that the case? Yes, that is the case. Okay. And, and where was that? Oh, it was in Burlington Township, New Jersey. Okay. And were your folks musicians? Uh, my dad's a musician. What kind of music? He plays jazz and he plays um, a little bossa nova. He plays the trombone and the guitar. Okay. So he's been playing in big bands and solo and that kind of stuff. Yeah. And, and when uh, when did you get the music bug and when did you kind of lean towards old timey or whatever you want to call it, folk music? Right. Um, I had the music bug since be- way before I can remember. <laughs> yeah. There, there's pictures of me a, as a baby staring at my dad playing the guitar. And, you know, so that was always part of my life. We always sang and things like that. Um, the old time is still kind of happened when I went to college. Um, up before that had been mostly classical for me. Um, but uh, I went to college. I took a tape with me um, that I had recorded off the air on a folk, some folk show in Philadelphia. And I just fell in love with it down there and I could play it over and over. And that was really when it started. Cool. Just listening to folk music. Yeah. I also liked, uh, you know, British folk music, Irish folk music. Yeah, and then uh, did you immediately go out and try to buy an acoustic guitar or banjo or something? No, I, I had a guitar already. I had a classical guitar that I think I had since I was in seventh grade. Um, so I, I, I didn't really try to play it much, but I listened to it a lot. Um, I did uh, try to learn the song High on a Mountain, which was, turns out later on, it was uh, recorded by Ola Bell Reed. I had that on my tape. Uh-huh. I just was crazy about that song. Um, I guess I got a banjo about five years after that, and I could not figure it out, so I kind of put it away. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and then, uh, and then, when did you take it up? Uh, around two thousand. Um, um, my ex-husband and dear friend uh, Les. I met him, and I told him all about how I loved all about Reed and all this kind of stuff, and he. Um, I didn't know what kind of banjo she played or anything like that. And he kind of clued me into the whole old time scene and gave me a bunch of tapes. And I really got the bug then. And then um, uh, I got some instructional tapes to learn how to play claw hammer. And I started going to a couple of gatherings. I went to the Swan and Noah gathering and the, um, Allegheny Echoes gathering in West Virginia. And, learning from tapes and then watching people play too yeah now those those gatherings are a cool scene onto themselves was it intimidating oh, yeah. going there for the first time or are they are they pretty welcoming of the new banjo player 
They're very welcoming. Yeah. Um, the Allegheny Echoes was really small, and um, actually, I went there to do a songwriting kind of track. So I took my my guitar, and I was, I was pretty comfortable playing the guitar, flat pick, and I could jam with people because I could pick out chords pretty well. Um, uh, but I would I would watch some of the banjo players just trying to see what's going on because <laughs> so I still really wanted to play the banjo. Yeah. And uh, but they were really nice. It was a small group. It was really fun. And uh, Swan and Noah was like even nicer than that. They were super welcoming and people were jamming. And I didn't know anybody when I went down there, but I made fast friends with people. Nice. And you know, people were up all night playing. It was wonderful. Loved it. Now at this point, is your your sister into this music as well? Um, not so much. Okay. You know? I mean, she likes it, but I, I play it more than she does. Yeah. She plays it along with me, and she kind of has her own sort of strumming style she made up to go along with my banjo playing. But um, You dragged her into she, it. Uh, nah. <laughs> <laughs> Coaxed, maybe. No. <laughs> and you guys did, is it two records together? Um, we did one record that got released. Um, okay. And before that, we did two records on our own. Okay. And then uh, tell me about the, the solo record, the one that's coming out this month. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, that that's really kind of, I wanted to kind of, I don't know, document my journey with the banjo and kind of play ode to that and, play, and that kind of music. But at the same time, at the same time it's real personal because I did the whole thing myself, which is kind of weird for old time music. Yeah. But but I was living on a farm in the middle of New Jersey, so I mean, it's pretty much the easiest way to play was to record with yourself. Um, so yeah, that was that was a uh, kind of the background for that album. So I I uh, went into a bunch of old records and tried to pick some things to um, inspire me and some things to uh, cover, and I found that the Twin Sisters. By Sidney Myers that I, I really wanted to learn how to play. Um, not as well as his, but I really wanted to figure out a version of that. Totally. And and what uh, when you're looking at old time songs, when you're looking at songs that have been recorded dozens and dozens of times, like what's your approach to them to kind of put your own personal spin on it? Um, yeah, I don't try to ever play exactly the same part or anything like that. I usually just kind of learn the song by singing along so I know the melody and then I kind of put my references away and noodle around with it myself Mm -hmm. and I usually just kind of play what sort of comes naturally with my hands and my banjo my particular banjo and uh, after a while I I kind of get it far enough away from the original that I feel like that, that you know that's a good version for me yeah and what kind of banjo are you using for all these songs um, almost all of them were a Wildwood um, heirloom banjo. Okay. And one of them I did on a little banjo from uh, where are they? Deering. It's like a little soprano banjo. Okay. Are, are two banjos? Is that your banjo quiver, or are there more lurking in the background? I have an old time banjo that I got when I first first started playing. Yeah. From not old time, good time, good time banjo from Deering. So I I still love that. I still carry it around. It's light and you know. I can beat it up a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you're you're you mentioned that you're you're on a farm in the middle of New Jersey. Are you a farmer? No, and I'm not there anymore, but okay. I was there for about 10 years and uh they we leased the farm to a, a farmer, a big commercial farmer. Got it. With my husband's um family farm. Got it. Um from a for a West Coast guy, it's still mind-boggling to think of big farms being in New Jersey, but it makes sense. Oh, I know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> They're hidden in the middle. <laughs> it is the Garden State. Um, yeah, and it's very close to the Turnpike, too. <laughs> yeah, and so uh, did you record at the farm, or did you go into a studio? No, I recorded at the farm. The cool. Album. Yeah. Like one microphone, or what's your what's your technique there? Uh, yeah, I was using one microphone, and I think I did all the tracks separately. Yeah. You know, I don't think I sang and played at the same time. I probably did a scratch, a scratch track singing and playing at the same time to get the tempo right, but yeah, just one mic. Nice. A laptop, and just Cubase. Yeah. Just tried to tried to keep people from making a lot of noise while I was recording. <laughs> I didn't do much to soundproof it or anything. Yeah. And what's next just for you? Are, are you gonna tour with this? Um, I don't know. I haven't 
I mean, a couple dates set up, but I would love to. I'm kind of behind getting that organized, but yeah. I would love to tour. Do you have? Yeah. yeah. Do you have another job, another gig in your life? Yeah, I do uh, graphic design and web development, but I'm, I'm freelance, so I'm flexible with my hours. Okay. Yeah. Well, and if you toured, would it, would you just do solo, or is that is that kind of crazy making to think of that? No, I think I would do solo, especially for this album. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, we are, uh, I guess, streaming Pretty Polly on fretboardjournal.com, and, and we we love your arrangement of it. So. Um, oh, thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. Was there any uh, was there any interesting approach you took to that one that you want to talk about? Uh, no, I don't think so. That was one of the first songs I taught myself, though, on a banjo. Yeah. So it was, you know, that was kind of close to my heart. You know, after I got the basic boom chuck a thing down, that was one of the first ones I picked out. Yeah. And I just love the story and nice haunting. Yeah. Tune. You you mentioned a couple folks who are a couple songs that really influenced you over the years. What what are you listening to right now? Oh, I listen to a lot of stuff um, from like Javanese gamelan music to classical, whatever, like modern classical to... um just whatever. I love exploring on Spotify, um, but I still listen to old time music too, especially um, Sheila K. Adams and um, Jenny Hawker and Tracy Sports. Two of my very favorites. Cool. Well, Laura, thank you so much for talking to us. This was great. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. All right. My pleasure. Yeah, bye. Okay. All right, that was fun, right? I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, it was great getting to know Laura a little bit. Now here's our talk with Richard Jones Bamman about the world of old time and open back banjos. Richard, welcome to the Fretboard Journal podcast. I don't know a whole lot about you. Are you a former Bay Area guy? I am. Um, I was. Uh, I was the third partner at Griffin. Um, you know, there are aspects of Griffin's history that have not always made it to the public. I didn't leave in disgrace or anything like that, but it was, uh, I, I left in 1987. So it's just, you know, it's been a very long time. I was there more in the, the formative years of that business. It was still, still pretty small, comparatively speaking, when I, I left. And in fact, we moved to Seattle. Um, lived in Seattle for almost a decade while I, I went back to graduate school and got, uh, got a degree. Okay. And then, we ended up here on the East Coast in 96, so we've been here a long time. Okay, and what have you been up to recently? Well, I retired okay. um, b- very recently, but I, I was a, a music professor okay. at a small state college, very small, about 4,000 students. Sounds lovely. Uh, I have a degree in, in ethnomusicology, so that's that's what I have been doing. But, you know, it's a small, a small enough department, a small enough school that I got to teach a lot of interesting classes uh didn't have to ta- teach a lot of big general education courses which i did when i was at university of washington so sure. it was a nice escape to get away from gigantic classes with students who i think were justifiably not terribly engaged when there were 300 of them sitting in a lecture hall of course and there's nothing like that here my big the biggest class i ever had under contract was 40 students That's and most amazing of them smaller than that yeah. yeah it was great really great and to be a publicly funded institution on top of that. Yeah. Know, it's pretty swell. Yeah, nice. So, but in through all of that, you know, I've, I've maintained uh, a real strong interest in the instrument world because that's kind of what I grew up with, what I, that's what made Griffin in the first place. And it was about, oh, I'm going to say it was a good 10 years ago that I hit on this idea of, um, I was tenured, I was promoted, I didn't have to worry about what kind of research I was going to do, so I, I hit upon this idea to focus on instrument builders, um, because it didn't seem to me like there had been um, enough written about the builders themselves, unless they were these highly prosaic, hyperbolic, the genius of Stradivari or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and in particular, since I'm a banjo player, I thought it would be fun to interview some banjo makers. So that was kind of the, the beginning of all of this. Um, and I'm very thankful that I had 
a number of contacts still left over from my days at Griffin. There were a number of people that I had met, had known, corresponded with way back then and have stayed in touch with. So I had my foot in the door to at least get started. And um, at, and 10 years yeah. ago when you, you had this initial idea, did you kind of have an overarching thesis of what would become a book or was it more just, I love banjos, there's so many great builders now, why don't I interview a few of them? I think it was a, probably a little more of the latter rather than the than the former. Um, I, I had some ideas, of course, but I discovered a long time ago that when I'm when I start a research project that involves uh, people and everything I have done always has interviewing folks, I kind of like to go in with a tabula rasa, a clear slate, um, not put too much of myself into it. Go in and just start feeling around, see what people people themselves are interested in what what they're talking about and so i started uh actually started with an interview now that i think of it in 2005 with chuck augsbury whom i've known since the 1970s uh, just kind of picking his brain you know what what was going on in the banjo world and at that point he was uh was kind of excited they were having more luck with open back banjos again for the first time in a while and that got pushed aside because I ended up on a sabbatical teaching overseas and didn't think about any of this stuff. But when I came back to it, my notion was I I really want to work with people who build open back instruments because I saw that as a um, a much more flexible field than those who are are building the infinite master tone clones. You know, there there just isn't a lot of room for um, big creative pushes with with bluegrass banjos I, I think the there's a lot of creativity but it's really nuanced by comparison where in the open back world there's certainly you can't n- nobody's going to to uh, is interested in buying an open back banjo that's purple and has a whammy bar on it or something like that but there is still i think i thought my notion was there's a lot more flexibility so it would be interesting to interview a bunch of people and just get their take on what they thought was happening. From that, however, it uh, then the project really began to to get up on its own feet, and I began to think about the banjo in old time music contexts that, that music I've played forever, and realizing that the banjo is unique, at least in that musical context, in that it's it's kind of this anchor to the past. And old-time music, as I'm sure you're aware, I mean, it's all about nostalgia. It's all about the past. What what else would encourage middle-class America to spend a week in a Spartan camp in West Virginia playing tunes and dealing with chemical toilets? I mean, there has to be, there has to be something going on there that is drawing people together. And I think a lot of it's romanticized, but there's still, to me, the banjo was the anchor there because it plays a unique role in that music. It's not like the fiddle, which is ubiquitous. The guitar is ubiquitous. There are, as a fiddle player, you can play all kinds of things. If you're an open back banjo player, you're kind of giving yourself over to this instrument and to that music. And I think one of the other things that really stood out in, immediately when I was interviewing um, these banjo builders is how many of them were really good players and again in my admittedly somewhat limited experience of for years meeting violin makers and guitar makers I didn't see as many of them being involved in that side of it you know really pushing how the instrument is being played as well as as focusing on how it was constructed so it it sets up this interesting discursive dialogue that's somewhat internal between the builder and the instrument, but then there's also all of this opportunity for incredible feedback from the players to the builders, because once you're playing tunes together, you're equals. It's not, there's not quite as much of that uh, rarefied air that only the builders occupy. There's some of that that goes on, but it's at least... This is, this is what I began to hear coming from the builders themselves, that they considered themselves to be 
part of a community and that they played a rather significant role in helping to create and maintain that community in ways that I'm not sure you'd get from a guitar maker because that guitar maker's instruments might be, they, you know, they could just as easily be played in a jazz context or they could be played in a pop context or they could be played in a bluegrass context and it might be the same person who's doing it four different weekends, whereas most of these open back players, you know, that's what they're doing. They're playing old time music with, I'm, Admittedly, I'm being a little reductive here in, in thinking that old time means only one thing, but it is a relatively narrow musical field, comparatively speaking. So the more I dug into this with this notion that the, the banjo becomes this kind of anchor to the past, this, this nostalgic instrument, what of course became clear immediately is that uh, there are aspects of the banjo's past that nobody wants to talk about, right? It's it, it's a little delimited, or at least it was for a very long time. We we tended to ignore its origins in Africa. We tended to ignore its relationship with plantation culture and enslaved populations, and we tended to ignore minstrelsy. These were all things that were kind of pushed aside. Certainly were when I took up the banjo in the, the late 60s and early 70s. And one of the most remarkable things that came about with the interviews that I was doing is that you know, people like Kevin Enoch, who's creating these amazing modern variations on the great Boston-based companies, uh, Fairbanks, Fairbanks and Cole, Vega, Haynes, Bay State, all of that stuff, he at the same time was telling me, no, you know, you're going to have to talk to the guys who are making antebellum instruments. They, they, their voice needs to be in this because their voice is starting to be heard, not just among banjo collectors or geeks who are into antebellum music or uh, Civil War reenactors or something like that, but that you know, they're they're part of this big dialogue that's going on in old time music, and they're bringing another voice to the table. They're essentially saying. Yeah, all that's true. We, we love these 19th, late 19th century instruments, and they're the icons for us, the white ladies, the tuba phones, the whatevers. But there are these other instruments that are there, too, and they're part of this. They're part of this story. And it's those guys that are building these instruments from the, those earlier eras that I think have kind of pushed the notion of the old-time past deep with something that's been, to my mind at least, it's been so constrained by past. You know, what what constitutes the past? Well, if you if you look at the old time banjos that are being manufactured, nobody's really, even in the modern setting, nobody's really building something, as I said, that is particularly modern, right? I mean, there's there's no real modern aesthetic here. It's as though the banjo reached its peak of development in the late 19th century, early 20th century. And everything becomes fixated on that. So if you can't push it forward, if you can't develop the instrument by pushing it forward, maybe the development happens by pushing it back and start making people more aware of those early instruments. And there, there, are, there are different ways this is happening. I mean, there are, there are guys who make minstrel-type banjos who really, their whole notion here is just simply, it, it was cool, it's a cool project, and you can take this instrument and you can do with it whatever you like. You can play standard old-time repertoire on it. You can maybe horse around and play some minstrel tunes. And that, that constitutes a small group of builders. But there's an even larger group out there building gourd instruments and minstrel-style banjos who are really fixated on having a dialogue about race that we should, it, if we're going to play these instruments, then let's acknowledge what, where they come from. Let's talk about what this instrument's past, the, the good parts and the ugly parts. Now let's talk about cultural appropriation. And these, you know, this is not stuff that's coming from my head. This is coming from the mouths of builders like Pete Ross and George Wunderlich who are saying this is the reason we do this stuff is so that people can't ignore it anymore. That's a pretty amazing thing that, to me that's been going on. And as a result, you know, so how does that impact a community? Well, People could ignore it entirely, right? They could walk away and say, "Yeah, well, you know, I don't, I don't come to play this music to be reminded of America's ugly history. 
But, and I, you know, I'm sure that constitutes a small percentage of people who are, who, who play old time music, don't want to be bothered by that. But increasingly, it's, I'm finding going to festivals, people want to hear this stuff. There are fellows and ladies that will show up and put on a small demonstration, talk about this music. You look at the popularity of, I know they're not working together much anymore, but the Carolina Chocolate Drops, the impact that they were having, which is you know, really drawing attention to all of this, with people who were saying um, there are these other voices out there and they need to be heard. And you start digging into a lot of the repertoire and realizing, oh, that tune, Yellow Rose of Texas, that's actually from the minstrel stage, and so was Arkansas Traveler, and some of the, you know, the old war horses of old, old-time music are directly coming from plantation-era America. Sure. So... So, so how many builders did you end up interviewing for this book, and how many were kind of rooted in that real minstrel uh, era banjo past, and how many were yeah. more of the traditional open back, or what we think of as the open back banjos? Right. Um, let me answer that and see. Uh, I'll try to cover all of those. I, I did 30 interviews okay. total. Of that, 21 of those were builders. The others were either people I know as banjo historians or collectors, Peter like uh, people like Peter Zago and Jim Bowman sure. and uh, Ed Britt. Um, and I also interviewed a handful of, of old-time musicians whom I know over the years, people that I know that are kind of actively involved in this conversation, people who are pretty articulate. So, so 21 builders. Of those 21, here's where it gets a little bit difficult um, because, of course, some of these these guys, and I do say guys, I mean, you know, one of the things that became immediately clear was that women are not very actively involved in this. I try it as I might, I managed to interview two. Okay. Um, and they were all white males, so that says something as well. They're, you know, something that should be addressed maybe with another book. But um, of those 21, some make all kinds of banjos. A guy like Noel Booth makes basically anything. He makes as you said, standard traditional open back banjos. He also makes minstrel style banjos, and he makes gourd banjos. But there, I, I, I allowed myself uh, the latitude to to create kind of an artificial bifurcation. That is, I divided them. Uh, there are those that clearly only made gourd instruments or only made minstrel style banjos. They were easy, but there were some that that bridged the gap. So let's see, one, two, three. I think there were eight that were focused almost entirely on building what I would call early banjos, early examples of the banjo, either gourd instruments or um, minstrel-era antebellum-style instruments, or both in some cases. Yeah. Fascinating. And uh, so, Go ahead. No, that's quite right. No, I was just going to say, um, and the folks who are making sort of the, for lack of a better word, gourd banjos, are they... Mm-hmm. Are they innovating or are they trying to you know basically replicate what few examples exist in museums these days i think it's i think it's both um and I, I, there are a couple of reasons for that and you touched upon it actually with the question that you asked so few examples i mean you know there, there's virtually nothing out there um it takes a lot of imagination and uh a lot of creativity to look at something like the old plantation painting, the one that hangs uh, at uh, Williamsburg in the museum there. I'm sure you're familiar with this, even if you don't know the name, but it's a very, very famous big watercolor of of some enslaved people dancing to a fellow playing the banjo and another guy beating on a a gourd like a drum. Mm -hmm. How do you turn that into an instrument? That takes something to be able to extrapolate from that two-dimensional representation and turn it into a three-dimensional instrument. So there are there are people who are doing that. So that that's creative as well. Um, but to answer maybe a little more specifically, there are certainly guys who are, are making things that um, are as much a part of their imagination as anything else. But they, even in talking with them about that, there's a certain acknowledgement or a certain reverence for the past, that what they're doing, they're doing because they want to find that connection. You know, they don't want that aspect of the banjo to be ignored. So 
So if that means limiting themselves to building with grain measures and uh, old cheese presses and gourds and things like that, they'll do it. Even if the instrument they're making, in all honesty, comes across a little bit more like a modern banjo, it's set up in a way that makes it ultimately playable by anybody who's ever played a banjo. Yeah. So, including adding frets in some cases, you know. Yeah, yeah. So, so I get the impression this book is a a little academic. You you're definitely a historian. It's called Building New Banjos for an Old Time World. How did you break yeah. it down? How what are the chapters like? What did you tell me about it? Sure, sure. Well, as uh, as I'm sure you know, as a writer yourself, you know, it's, it's there are a bunch of different ways you can organize something like this. Um, the book begins with an introduction that really talks about uh, the banjo in American culture. It's a very real quick overview. I'm not trying to get overly historical sure. at all. Um, and the, it's really the first two chapters that cover most of that. Oh, I'm sorry, the first, first chapter. The second chapter, I, I spent quite a bit of time um, going into what constitutes old-time music. I mean, what, what do we mean by that, at least in a, a modern context. And here I was really trying to touch bases with work that's been done on folk revival and um, drawing attention to some of the the really crucial core bands ranging from the New Lost City Ramblers through groups like Fuzzy Mountain and High Woods and bringing some banjo makers into that, bringing some of the information I got from banjo builders, particularly those that have been building for quite a while, the impact on them as builders by those musicians. The third chapter is actually a focus on building an instrument, and for that, I used um, a banjo course that was taught by Will Fielding, who unfortunately is no longer with us. Um, Will and I had become quite good friends. He was, he was based in Vermont, and three different times he offered a banjo building course in two different locations in Vermont, and I went and observed um, a building course so I used that as the basis of how does one build a banjo? What are the what are some of the issues that as a builder you would have to deal with? At first, obviously making the decision: am I making an instrument that's open back, or am I making an instrument with a resonator? Well, we'll say because it's old time music. Generally speaking, we're not going to bother with a resonator, and we're not going to talk about flanges and things like that. You know, there's a there's a particular model in mind. Um, but I I tried to go at this so that a person who never built an instrument would at least become relatively familiar with some of the terminology. That was really the reason for that chapter. Mm-hmm. Um, but once again, I, I set that up as a place where other, other builders could speak. So my idea was, what would happen if you had somebody who was teaching a course like this, and at the same time you had a bunch of other builders who were sitting around at a table talking about some of the decisions that were being made? So when Will would say, you know, I'm going to use, uh, I I decided to use a truss rod or I'm going to talk to you about whether we put a scoop in at the end of the fingerboard, and I used that as a place to interpolate information from other builders saying, well, yeah, there there is a good reason to do this, or, uh, you know, I wouldn't do that for the following reason. So it, it becomes this kind of imaginary dialogue that I think it came out better than this probably sounds when I try to describe it. <laughs> sounds good. It's, it's, it is actually pretty well organized. It was the, um, in fact, it was the, the chapter, I think, that hooked the press when I sent that in. That was the one that the, the readers, the initial readers, all liked very much. So I guess I got that right. Yeah. And then from there it goes to um, a discussion about those who build primarily, as we've been saying, this kind of the traditional idea of, of a banjo. And individual profiles of builders, but they're not biographical. And I was using each builder to kind of introduce a different idea, a different notion. So um, when I interviewed Kevin Enoch, he, he, wanted, he talked quite a bit about Kyle Creed and that the impact that Kyle Creed had had on, on the banjo playing community with his notion of... of a slightly different banjo, what has really become more the modern modern model, where you're moving the shortening the scale length, moving the the bridge closer to the middle of the, the head, um, 
Kyle Creed was using 12-inch pots occasionally instead of 11-inch. All of that was kind of new, and Kevin picked up on that early on. So I used information I got from Kevin to kind of introduce that. Let me think. I don't even uh, know Kyle Creed. Is that is that a well-known builder? He, he, he was a well-known builder and player. Okay. Kyle Creed was one of those guys like Tommy Jarrell and uh, Paul Sutphin and Fred Cockrum, all from that same area, Surrey County, North Carolina. Okay. Um, Kyle passed away, I think, in 1987, Okay. possibly. So there's a good reason why you wouldn't necessarily know of him. And he was never as... Um, he was never the focus that Tommy Jarrell was among the folklorists. There were not a whole lot of people that went out and interviewed him. So, and, and Les Blank didn't make a movie about okay. it or anything like that. <laughs> but uh, if you look up Kyle Creed um, and the Camp Town Boys, which was the band that he had, they were mind-boggling. They won at Galax a bunch of times, and he won at Galax a bunch of times. He was a great, great player, but very idiosyncratic. Nobody... Um, there, for all the Kyle Creed banjos, there isn't one that's necessarily like any other. He just he built things out of whatever he had at hand. But that fourth chapter is really dealing once again with this notion of the past and how how the fle- the past is flexible enough that people can focus on certain parts of it and say, when I build this banjo, I'm going to acknowledge the past in the following way. So with Kevin Enoch, what you have is a guy who has learned unbelievable engraving skills and carving skills and a design aesthetic that is just, it's like he's channeling the 19th century. But at the same time, he's building an incredibly desirable modern instrument. He has incorporated things that he picked up on from banjo players. He's a banjo player himself. His wife is a terrific banjo player. Um, And from Kyle Creed, who was influencing people in, as I said, kind of a modern way. So Kevin's banjos are thin-rimmed, Big pots, uh, 25 and a half inch scale, scoop at the end of the fingerboard. This is all new stuff. And yet you look at it aesthetically and you're thinking, my God, this looks like the best Fairbanks banjo I ever saw in my life. (laughs) So with each one of the builders that's in that chapter, I, I tried to show how they're dealing with the past from a very individual perspective. So there's a guy there, and there's a guy in California that hardly anybody knows about, Chuck Waldman, who built these wonderfully innovative, odd instruments. His whole idea was he wanted to make everything out of wood if possible, and he was after a particular sound. So he kind of redesigned a Vega tubaphone, making the tone ring in the instrument out of wood. Okay. And in so doing, he created something altogether different than what he was after. But he's created something that's, that's quite wonderful. He has quite a following these days. Um, then the next chapter, chapter five, gets into uh, the folks who are, are really wrestling with these older instruments. And it, once again, I kind of separated it into those who play around the edges with it. Um, and I don't mean that in a disrespectful way at all, but people who, who have chosen to uh, maybe not to be quite as explicit in their concerns over issues of cultural appropriation and race. Mm-hmm. They're perfectly aware of it and willing to talk about it, but it isn't kind of the reason they're doing it. So Bob Thornburg in Bishop, California, Jeff Menzies, who's now in Jamaica but was in in uh, Toronto area when I interviewed him, um, uh, gosh, uh, no, Alan Hart. No, Alan, I would have included elsewhere. I'm sorry, I've, it's been a while since I've looked <laughs> at this book. Um, but, and then it, that chapter kind of winds up with, um, with people like Alan Hart and, and George Wunderlich and Pete Ross, all of whom have a very explicit agenda in what, what they're building and why. Um, and they're quite different. I mean, with Pete, um, you guys did a you did a wonderful article about a banjo that that Kevin and Pete Ross made for Peter Zago. That was a while ago, yes. And, yeah, quite a while ago. That's true. And you know, Pete is capable of of making conventional, traditional banjos, but he got pulled into this because of an interest in he heard about gourd banjos and had absolutely no idea what they might sound like. So. His whole reason for creating a gourd banjo was simple curiosity. What 
what would it sound like? What would it be like? And in so doing, he found himself completely enmeshed in this this history and these historical questions. And he now, he and his his girlfriend are they're among the most cited historians in this. I mean, they've really put a lot of effort into it. And as a result, I mean, he's a very creative guy. He's made instruments on, that are on display in Williamsburg. The Musical Instrument Museum in Brussels has a couple of his banjos. Um, and they're exquisite replicas of the earliest extant instruments or the earliest representations, visual representations of instruments. So if you want that banjo that's in the old plantation painting, you go to Pete because he's made it. Mm-hmm. Um, the last chapter is my attempt to sum it up and also to ask, you know, so what? <laughs> what do we do about all of this? Where does it go? Yeah. Um, and that's a tough one. I, I, I'd i like to say that I think we're um, we're getting better as a society dealing with this stuff, but... Um, no, I'm not sure how much I believe that right now. Yeah, it's. But I, I I find it interesting that this instrument, which has been so deeply inscribed in our culture, for better or worse, has become um, a means, at least, that some percentage of the population is talking about it. We're talking about issues of race now because of this instrument, and it's people are not. You can't avoid it any longer. And that's thanks to, obviously, people like the Carolina Chocolate Drops and, and some other folks, but it's also really thankful to the people that, who had the, the nerve and the interest in building them so that we can't walk away. We can't simply say, ah, eh, you know, I saw that old picture and that, that tells me something. Well, now we have people presenting papers at academic <laughs> conferences about Joel Walker Sweeney and... I mean, there's a lot going on out there that I think, and a, a really interesting couple of books that have come out in the last two or three years about the banjo and its African origins. Yeah. So, lots of good stuff. So, yeah, I guess that's that's kind of how the book is. That's the best way I would describe the book. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's interesting to me. I a lot of these uh, open back banjo builders seem to me, maybe I'm just basing thing, books off their covers, but um, they seem to have come from maybe a punk rock background and mm-hmm. and their progressive ethos or whatever lent them, or maybe they just thought it would be fun and different to, to take up the banjo and then eventually start building yeah. them. I'm sure you ran into that. Absolutely. there. It, it's a little more, um, I would say that's somewhat regional. Mm-hmm. That uh, That's certainly the case in um, on the West Coast and in particular in the Northwest. Mm-hmm. There are a couple of builders there that undeniably come from punk rock backgrounds, but that's true actually of most of the musicians who are playing too. Yeah. There's that wonderful, as you said, there's this, there's this connective ethos that one finds in both of those communities. And I, it makes a lot of sense. Um, it's not quite so true out here, uh, and perhaps even less so in the southeastern part of the U.S., yes. where the banjo has been there whether people paid attention to it or not, but it, it's been it's been a focus for a very, very long time. So people have been drawn into it. I'm not, not negating that. Yeah. I'm not suggesting that it can't happen that way, but I think it's less common. You, you mentioned the Carolina chocolate drops a few times, um, yeah. which beg, begs the next question. I'm sure you looked high and low. Is there not a single African-American building banjos uh, of this style in America right now? There is. She's and she's relatively new to it, and you have no idea how sorry I am that I didn't. We didn't cross paths until long after I'd finished the manuscript. Okay. Um, there is a, a woman. I don't have her name off the top of my head. I'm so sorry. I can look it up. I, I just spoke with her at Clifftop. Um, I met her a couple of years ago there. Um, she's an African American woman who is making gourd banjos. And, you know, my goodness, if anybody deserved a voice in this, she was the one. But I just, I couldn't amend something that was already well in the pipeline. Sure. So. Well, well, we'll make sure to include her name. But um, where was, she, I'm sure you had to talk to her. What, where is she coming from uh, doing this? She's, she got enthusiastic about this, I, I believe, through um, 
having heard somebody play the banjo, somebody making the statement, you know, this is an African instrument. Um, she's a, a storyteller. So I think her first involvement with the instrument was um, using it as a, I don't want to say a prop, but something that added to the experience of the stories that she was telling. And she had made a few things before, so she's making uh, nice, simple gourd instruments. Nice. Yeah. So I just go ahead. No, it's all right. No, I was going to say. So where, just to wrap this up, where do you, where do you see this going? Not only just the dialogue about the history of the banjo, including some things that perhaps weren't talked about much in the past, but um, from talking to all these builders, from being a part of the community now, um, where do you are there trends in where the builders are starting to uh, line their careers and, and think about where they're building or, or what. What's going on yeah. in, the, in the future? Yeah, good question. Well, um, what's fascinating is, particularly when you talk with some of the people who've been doing this for a long time, because of the shifts that they have seen. So I would say the 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 banjo buyer today, um, particularly a younger player, you know, somebody who's really coming to the music perhaps from a different musical background is looking for an instrument that's probably quite different than the instrument I looked for when I started playing this music. Um, and you know, this, this opens up another discussion we should have another time about what's going on with vintage instruments and why is it that... Sure. Because some of it has to do with price. But over time, the icons, the, the banjo icons, the white ladies and the tuba phones, there's a lot less interest in those instruments now. Um, much more interest in things that uh, either predate that, as in the really old instruments, or things that are a little more, I hate to use the term, but primitive in their structure, Mm -hmm. minimal hardware, not much in the way of a tone ring, maybe simply stretching the skin over a a rounded top that might be of a different hardwood sort of a tone ring. so you have builders who I think are kind of, um, they're, they have a freedom at this point that they certainly didn't have 25 years ago or 20 years ago, where the models were, I think, much narrower. If you're going to make old-time banjos, open-back banjos, they need to pay explicit reverence to those iconic instruments. If you can't make a white lady, it should at least be be obvious that that's what inspired you. <laughs> sure. But that's not happening today. So you have, there's a, there's a, a young guy um, who's, I just met at Clifftop who's making these wonderful, crazy banjos that have um, pig heads that look like they came out of the electric guitar world. And I, I don't know how people were reacting to them, but the fact that he was there and showing them and lots of people were stopping by to look at them. So I think there's, I think we're moving, and uh, I'm not sure we're ever going to get to that purple banjo with the whammy bar. I kind of hope not, but I think I think the environment is much more open to that kind of thing as as a lot more young people come to this this uh, music who don't quite bring the same agenda with them that my generation did, where we were just so convinced it had to be. It had to look just like that banjo that was on the cover of the new Lost City Ramblers first album or something like that. You know, the models have changed. Yeah. And that's showing up in the way people play, too. The I keep referring to Clifftop, but it is kind of the, the, the index by which things can be measured in terms of what's going on in the old-time world. And the each year at the... the uh, contests where they have a traditional band contest and then they have the neo-traditional band contest i love the neo-traditional band contest because you never know what you're going to see i mean it can be it can be a group of people from nepal who are playing old-time music in a very interesting way this last year it was a group from argentina who won and they were terrific and singing in spanish through most of it but and a banjo player who played with played three-finger style, sort of scrug style, or or an old-fashioned three-finger style right through the whole thing. So 
I think it, in trying to answer your question, I guess I'm, I'm trying to demonstrate that there's still this connection between where the music is going and where the instruments are going. And it's, it goes, there's this dialectic here that's, that's always in play as to who's leading home. Are the builders the ones that are pushing the envelope, or are the musicians the ones who are pushing the envelope? And I would say it's both. It just kind of depends on which, which moment in time you're talking about. Yeah. Fascinating. This has always been a little fascinating subculture in my mind to uh, the fretted instrument world. I'm glad you helped chronicle it. Well, let's hope. You know, it was a, it was a labor of love, uh, and I mean that in all the best possible <laughs> ways. It was really interesting fun project um my only regret was it just it took longer than anticipated but that that's due to the vagaries of having to work for a living as a yeah professor that is so hard this. yeah so all of my all of the interviews were done summertime or occasionally spring break i could get away and and stop and talk with people and then summers are really about the only time i had to write too but by god it's it's done. I'm going to be real done. happy to hold a copy of it in my hand. Congratulations. Thank you. All right. I hope you enjoyed that as well. This concludes the Fretboard Journal podcast for today. Sorry it was a little late this week. Got a lot going on here, trying to get this magazine ready for you guys. Um, next week on Friday, we're actually going to be talking to Colin Hay of Minute Work fame. I had a blast talking to this guy. I hope you enjoy it. Um, if you haven't subscribed to the Fretboard Journal podcast, please do so, and it will show up magically in your podcast delivery system, however you like it. Uh, but yeah, we talked about guitars, songwriting, and a lot more, so stay tuned for that. 